The sermon has the ominous title, The Final Judgment. (laughs) Hear now God's word from Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, just as we cannot speak without breath and air in our lungs going forward, so your word can't go forth without you, the breath of God going forth and preaching Christ to our hearts. And so we ask that you would make much of Jesus in your word and fill him up in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. So I'm going to begin my sermon at Knox Theological Seminary by saying that something heretical. Uh, Protestants believe in purgatory. Protestants believe in purgatory. Now, we don't believe in it in the same way that maybe the Roman Catholics do. We don't necessarily believe that somehow we're all going to die and then have to do penance and pay some sort of satisfaction and and do these works, whether it be rolling a rock up a big hill or uh, somehow working in some very slavish type labor situation to somehow get to the end of our sins together. But functionally, we have our own little purgatory. This purgatory takes the shape of uh, how our imaginations work when we think about what happens when we die. And though we all talk about salvation in Jesus Christ by faith alone, running around and moving around in our consciences and in our maybe evangelical folklore is this scenario of death. That when I die, before I pass over the threshold of the pearly gates, there's going to come that moment where God asks me some difficult questions. And maybe as a good Protestant, I will know the right way to answer them, that it's about Jesus and not about me. But often tied into this moment of what we believe happens at that time is this scary thought that God is going to somehow reveal all the things in our life that need revelation and that have been hidden in the deep places. And so on the, on the threshold of heaven, for many of us, we think that there's this moment where there's going to be a, a kind of embarrassment that we're going to have to walk through before we hit the other side of things. That's going to be our, our Protestant purgatory, that moment where we kind of have to face up and do penance a little bit just by standing in that moment and letting the wave of embarrassment fall over us as God says, this is who you really are. Let me show you. I recently saw this painful picture on the internet. It's a candid shot of a man with the most humiliated look on his face. The man is standing in the middle of a crowded shopping mall with a huge sign over his body, a sandwich board, which reads, I cheated on my girlfriend of three years and this is my punishment. And the man looked really forlorn as the people walked by and stared and snickered. And evidently, his girlfriend said, if if you want me back, you're going to have to own up to this and do this. And at least for me, someone who's grown up in the Protestant evangelical tradition, this has been my view of what final account before God 
before I pass over the threshold through the merits and grace of Jesus Christ looks like. A sandwich board over me that says, I cheated on my bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. Everybody come look at the way I've cheated. And this takes shape in a variety of ways, you know. Uh, the most classic example now is that before the gates of heaven are this, is this movie screen where all our evil deeds God will show and project. And then we're able to say, I claim yet Christ as my righteousness. But that moment of embarrassment, right, where all my evil deeds come in some wonderfully edited package that Doug Rom or someone else creates, you know, for us, where before the watching world, before my friends and family and before the saints in heaven, there's this moment where everybody knows just what a deep, dark, horrible sinner I am. Tim Keller talks about what another pastor said, uh, and that's even if uh, you don't believe in the Bible, as, as the scriptures say, our consciences bear witness to this. And so one pastor relayed, imagine that there's this tape recorder, this invisible tape recorder hanging around everybody's neck. And this tape recorder only picks up the things that we say to other people or, or say, say about them about the way that they should live. So the things that are truly in our consciences, right? And on Judgment Day, Keller says, I'm going to be very fair, you know. God's not going to judge you by the Ten Commandments. He's not going to judge you by the Bible. I'm not going to judge you. Uh, he's actually going to judge you over your own conscience, you know, your own standards, what you've said other people should live by. So let me grab that tape recorder and let me press play and see how you fare. You know, we all have these various myths of the way that final judgment will look. And it involves this moment of embarrassment, even for Protestants. It involves this kind of Protestant purgatory. And why are we nagged by this? Because there are things that you and I have done and thought, imagined, or enacted that only you and I know about. You haven't told your spouse or your best friend. Telling them would be far too devastating and far too repulsive. And how do I know that you harbor these things in your heart? Because I do. And then there are the scriptures that we look at that when we maybe take them out of context, which we do a lot of times, we hear these blanket statements that get thrown around that certainly need, as we as seminarians know, certainly need their proper contextual exegesis. But nevertheless, we hear them, and the folklore is developed around them. We hear passages like Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointment, appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And Revelation twenty two twelve, Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. If we're talking about being good Protestants, we have this general rule, though, that says that maybe the harder to understand parts of Scripture should be interpreted by those more clear parts. And I would submit to you that this passage from Paul in Romans 3 is actually quite clear about what happens at final judgment. Or maybe more precisely, as strange as it sounds, what happened at final judgment. And just so you know, I'm trying to be legit here. I was really impacted by these uh, exegetical ideas from a friend uh, who teaches, has taught, and continues to teach her, uh, but is currently living in England, Jonathan Linebaugh, the scholar. I was reading through his thesis and through a few articles, and it just hit me. Uh, the way he talked about some of the language that's going on in this passage. And when we hear a passage like the one from Romans 3, we need to pay attention to a sphere of language that would have rung differently in the ears of Paul's original hearers. 
You see, when we hear the words like righteous and righteousness, just and justify, our minds don't readily go to the same places that a first century Jewish person's would. For a first century Jewish person, hearing righteousness and justify would immediately conjure up, conjure up the context of none other than final judgment. We go back to Romans 2, where Paul offers a frightening rhetorical question in verses 4 and 5. And Paul asks, Do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment, there's that language, will be revealed. Here we have Paul clearly using righteousness and justification, that kind of language in the context of final judgment. Paul and God are clearly telling us that on the day of everyone's justification, that day is the day of final judgment. On that day, we will find out whether or not we are justified. Paul sums it up in a few verses later in verse 13 when he says, the doers of the law will be justified. He's basically saying, if you're good on that day in the future, you will be justified. God will, be, will declare you righteous. And then Paul does something quite odd because only one chapter later, he seems to flat out contradict himself. In chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Final judgment, still in the future tense, is looking pretty bleak. So maybe it is that you and I are really in the same boat as the original hearers. We're all hearing the same thing. Judgment is coming, and no one is getting a pass. Brace yourselves, the future's coming like a freight train. And when it hits you, you're going down. Our pseudo-righteousness, it'll be exposed. Our fake Christianity, our good works, that all really came from selfish motivation and therefore not truly good will be revealed. And certainly our evil deeds, our thoughts, our actions, our words, they will all come to light and final judgment. It will happen, except that all of a sudden, God shocks everyone with a word that none of us ever heard or dreamed before. There's a dramatic shifting of tense from the future to the present. In verse 20, it says, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But verse 21 says, but now, the righteousness, the justification, the future judgment of God is being revealed now, apart from the law, now. The righteousness of God through faith, now the justification of God through faith now in Jesus Christ. And if the present and the future couldn't get any more confusing, Paul starts throwing in the past. <laughs> Paul says, this is the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation in his blood. Paul is saying, our future judgment is being now revealed in a past event, the cross. And it was at the cross where all our evil deeds, all our pseudo good works, all our fake Christianity, all our sin was gathered and judged fully and finally on that cross. And it was at the cross where all of Jesus' life of perfectly good works were gathered and given to you and to me as our final verdict of justification. Forgive this crude drawing kids, it's like we're in elementary school again, but I find it helpful. According to Paul, the cross happened here in the past, and you and I are here in the present, and maybe it shouldn't be a smiley face, but one of those anxious emojis with a little tear or anxiety or sweat or something going on, right? And final judgment is here in the future. And then God does something strange with time. He starts to blend them all together and compress them into one moment, the now moment, the now declaration. And so to offer you a confusing but entirely biblical sentence, 
using all three tenses, right now, right now, your future judgment already happened. Right now, your future judgment already happened. Before your very eyes, God is saying to you, I have delivered my verdict of future judgment on you. Not guilty. And not only that, I now offer you the very words that I offered my own son on the day of his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Therefore, I ask with Paul, who asks this later, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. So this means that I don't care who you are or what you've done. Satan can't bring a charge against you that would be so damning as to jeopardize your final judgment because your final judgment already happened on the cross. This world can't bring any charge against you that would be so condemning, so revealing as to jeopardize your final judgment because your final judgment already happened at the cross. No, not even you and all your secrets can bring a charge against you that would be so unpardonable as to jeopardize your final judgment because your final judgment has already happened on the cross. And so if we must imagine a day where we stand before God, mano y mano, Paul urges us to imagine it going like this. God will ask you to give an account. And then and there, we will have an opportunity as it sounds to preach back the very word that God is preaching to us week in and week out in the gospel. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There, over there, on that hill, there is your account. There are your works. There is your righteousness. There, there on the cross, there is your final judgment. Believe upon Jesus as he proclaims from that cross. It is finished. And so, Christian, be assured that there is no purgatory. There's no future day when, before you enter heaven, your shame will be put on display. For that event already occurred when Jesus was made a public spectacle for you. Christ and all his benefits, including heaven, are yours, and nothing can take that away. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would hold this vision before us so that, so that as we prayed in the beginning, we might be freed up to love others and to serve you in this world without compulsion, without anything that would make us feel that failing at such would jeopardize our standing with you. Cause us to go from this place and to live in the kind of freedom that spurs us on toward love of you and love of neighbor. Give us this news again and again because we're very anxious people and there's lots of myths out there that obscure this for us. And help us to understand those hard, part, hard parts of your scriptures. But at the same time, hold for us that which is clear before us. That the cross was the destination of the apocalypse. It was the final place where you meted out your judgment for us. And cause us to find ourselves crucified with Christ and therefore no longer living, but he living in us. Amen.